Thank you. I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are meeting on Yungwulg land and certainly um, thank them for their wisdom uh, and the many things that they have taught me uh, in inviting me to be a part of uh, the Dupuma Foundation Learning Project. In the spirit of the co-design and power sharing, you'll notice that uh, Murphy Yonapingu is not here. And uh, that's partly because, not because he didn't turn up, but one of the hallmarks of this program is about power sharing and about um, co-design and about making decisions together. And so the young people that were going to join us as well with Murphy have decided that they would work together down in the youth forum area that's running at the same time and they're doing some education with some of those young people from uh, all over Australia and have left Cam and I to, uh, to present this to you this afternoon. But I'm sure that Murphy uh, and the young kids would be more than happy to talk to any of you at any time throughout the weekend. The uh, project is a really exciting project. And uh, as uh, Charlie said, it is a project that's um, a collaboration between the Northern Territory Government through the Department of Education and the Yothi Indy Foundation. Cam and I have the great privilege of, uh, of uh, running the program uh, alongside Murphy and in collaboration with the young people. Up on the screen you'll see um, what I think is a very powerful statement um, and a very powerful piece from uh, Gulleroy Yunapingu. It is through our ceremonies that our lives are created. These ceremonies record and pass on the laws that give us ownership of the land and the sea and the rules by which we live. Our ceremonial grounds are our universities where we gain knowledge that we need. We travel the song cycles that guide our life and the essence of our clans, keeping all in balance, giving our people their meaning is only the cycle of these events that can give young person or people the full energy that he or she requires for life. Without this learning, young can achieve nothing. They are nobody. A very, very powerful piece, I think. The vision of um, the wider vision of uh, a, a Gama Institute um, of which the Dupuma Foundational Learning Project is part, is that all you will have the foundation needed to steer their future, be role models, and balance Jungel and Balanda ways or worlds. A really powerful vision. I'm forgetting the uh, PowerPoint as you do. Just a short piece. Unfortunately, there's no sound. There is sound. shared that with quite a few people that day. The context in which we work, as you'd all know, is a very complex one. 
Um, we tried to animate this little thing, but it just got too complex. But if you look up on the screen, there's what we call our Medusa. There's so many people trying to be involved in education in this region, um, often in silos, often working with the same young people. It's a really complex um, environment with lots of people trying to do lots of good things, but often doing it without consultation and partnering with community. Cam and I often go to uh, collect our young people, oh, by the way, welcome to our classroom, and bring them here to our classroom. And sometimes there might be a line of, you know, three, four, five people wanting to talk to the same person before we actually pick them up to go to school. It might be a youth worker, it might be um, someone from Anglicare, it might be someone, it might be the police. It, it, but sometimes there's just this complex uh, environment of, of young pe that the young people are having to work within. The other part of a complex system and context that we're working in is a, a sad one, that East Arnhem Land is amongst the lowest attendance uh, of uh, young people uh, attending school. Um, this is a bit of a snapshot of um, the last semester um, at the Nullarbor High School, which is the school that we're attached to. So 58% 50, of um, young Aboriginal people attending school. 47 of those, or 47% of those uh, as the total young group. Um, I guess the, the nice figure in there is the 79% which are attached to the boarding school um, that, that goes to um, the Nullarbor High School, a really great program that if you uh, get a chance to go down and have a look at, it was really worthwhile. 36% of uh, the total, total young population across the region, not in board, across the, the Northern Boy High School's um, attendees, not in boarding. And then the 27% is, um, I guess, the young people that we're working with across the three communities that we work with uh, in this region. This, of course, is a, a proof of concept um, that is looking to be scaled, uh, hopefully, across the all of North East Arnhem Land over coming years and potentially, who knows, Vicky, across the Northern Territory. It's a really long-held vision uh, of Yungle people. Many of you would have heard of Dupama College, opened by Billy McMahon back in 1972, when he was the Prime Minister. If you want a proof of concept in terms of um, education that works with Yungle people and for Yungle people, I don't think you could probably go past the Dupalma College. Most of the leaders of this region went through this college. Unfortunately, around the time that we became self-governing in the Northern Territory, without much um, talking with anybody, the money was pulled from the Dupalma College. So there's been a long-term vision and a long-term um, yearning for the return of something that works with Yungle people for Yungle people with Yungle people, for Yungle people. And I guess in, 19, in uh, 2018, the Dupalma Foundation Learning Project was launched after much discussion. And that discussion really started at the closure of Dupalma College back in 1978. So it's been a long, long journey. The goals of the program are for Yungle and Indigenous students to have the same level of wellbeing that each and all, or those of us, those white fellows that are here, those people from down south, um, we, we have, it's not even questioned. Um, this is about them having the same privilege. It's about a flexible education program that works with young people that are disenfranchised. I would actually say alienated from the mainstream school system. Lots of us talk about um, young people being disengaged. I can tell you these young people certainly are not disengaged, they're extremely engaged. It's just not in mainstream education. And I think we need to really think about the language like disengagement because that's blaming the young person. It's not the young person, it's actually us that need to take the blame. So we're providing a flexible learning framework that allows um, learning in a context that makes sense for Aboriginal people. And of course, it's part of an unfolding um, vision of a wider Bush University here in this site.
Uh, firstly, I'd uh, like to acknowledge the uh, tr uh, traditional custodians and land in which we meet, uh, the Yongle people. I pay my respect to the elders past, present and future. Um, uh, I also would like to acknowledge our Minister Selena Yuvo um, and our, uh, our CE Vicky Bayliss um, and also the Yorthi Indy Foundation. Um, I'm here to talk about pedagogy and um, I guess the, the pedagogy that we've chosen to underpin the delivery of education um, in our space is a fusion really of what uh, was told to us by uh, key community reference group members um, uh, as well as key stakeholders in collaboration or in co uh, combination with um, uh, the research, and not limited to, but the research um, done by Professor Russell Bishop, the University of Waikato in New Zealand. Um, Russell Bishop was responsible for a wide-scale educational reform that significantly improved outcomes for Indigenous and marginalised students uh, in mainstream schools. And really, uh, key th central um, idea to um, that was this building of a family-like relationship between teacher and student. And then um, how that teacher then interacts in that uh, family-like context for learning in uh, the, using those discursive practices and then monitoring that progress in an action reflection or an in instructional leadership type model. I guess what else came into the research that Russell Bishop did was uh, this um, challenging of the idea of, t of treating all kids the same. Um, essentially what he was able to prove that uh, Maori and marginalised students actually get left behind by that discourse. And so they're the least well served by the traditional educational practices um, and, and in some cases current, well we say, let's say it, current educational practices. And so what needs to happen is that we place an extra focus uh, on this cohort of students so they can achieve the same sort of um, success as their non-Indigenous counterparts. Ultimately what he argues is that what works for Indigenous and marginalised students works for all students, but not necessarily the other way around. This graph shows data collected from 3,500 classroom observations uh, with 1,706 teachers over 20 schools over three years in terms one, two and three. And what is very, very clear from this graph is as that relationship between or the relation, relational experiences between a teacher and student and then student back to the teacher improves, so too does that teacher's ability to use the evidence-based discursive practices that we know make a difference to, um, uh, to uh, the outcomes of children. So what's interesting, if we were to split this graph into four quadrants, um, there's not even one outlier in the top left-hand corner that suggests otherwise, where you've got low relationships and high teaching skills. So that tells us that teachers in that space uh, not only don't use the strategies that we know make a difference, but we would argue they don't know how. And where we need to head, of course, is that top right-hand corner where we're using high relationships and those high discursive teaching practices. What is reassuring, uh, again from uh, Russell's research, is the idea that as that family-like relationship improves, so too does that teacher's ability to use those strategies at an exponential rate. So essentially, once it starts happening, there's no turning back, which is a good thing. The discursive practices are the easy part. This is how we've start to, started to contextualise um, this research and um, implement it in part of our space. So um, we worked with engaging, uh, we engaged with the um, uh, cultural advisors, um, we engaged with uh, key uh, parents and elders in the community and we unpacked this pedagogy and this research with the students. And what we um, were able to do then was work with this um, and some of the strategies that we are using within our um, family-like context for learning is around rejecting those deficit explanations for um, students' learning. So if any of those out there have heard of Carol Dweck and the, um, the, the uh, growth mindset stuff, that the, the errors and mistakes are actually a absolutely a critical um, part of that educational journey and, it, and we, we really encourage it. Um, the second one there is caring and nurturing of our students including their, their language and culture. You know, language and culture are not just objects. It's not just iconography. They're not just customs. It's about a sense-making process. So we really include that as part of our learning experience for the kids. We maintain a, a, a voice and demonstrate high expectations of children. We know that other educational programs have, have not engaged these students. So we share, we help them um, with that belief that we know that they can succeed and we 
going to do everything that we possibly can to make sure that happens. We treat kids like they're, they're our own children. Um, support in a supportive learning environment where kids, uh, a, a, you know, feel safe. All those routines and it's a, it's a well-organised place for kids to come to. Um, teacher content. You know, as teachers and educators in the space, we have to know what the content. Uh, we have to allow kids opportunities to co-construct lesson uh, intentions, learning intentions and success criteria with us. So, uh, and in a way that they want to learn. Um, and then providing those, you know, really important formative assessment um, strategies in, the, in feedback and feed forward. So kids not only know what they need to learn, but they, need, they know what their next steps are in their learning and how to do that. And really them dictating to us how that wants uh, is to happen. Prior learning, we know that kids come with extremely uh, a, a great deal of uh, information. Again, how we're using that, or we use that as a sense-making process. Um, and the two big ones really, and I'll, I'll get Peter maybe to talk about it if we get time a bit later, but co-constructing the learning. So kids are, are allowed again to dictate the way that things are done. We allow kids to ask questions. One of the biggest things that, you know, traditionally we shut down. And so asking questions then uh, sets, puts you on a journey of um, that inquiry based, you know, research topics and those types of things, again, owned by these kids. And the biggest thing that we would argue, uh, not argue, that we implement, as Peter mentioned, is um, the reversing the traditional power relationship between teacher and student. You know, teacher's voice all too often is heard more than what the student's voice is. We need to, we, we reverse that and we pro provide opportunities uh, for kids to be experts of the learning, to set up our family um, uh, group-like work so that kids are learning from kids. And then Pete, if you get an opportunity, um, maybe you could talk about some of those strategies that we used when the kids came up from Melbourne Girls Grammar. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Haven't finished yet, sorry. <laughs> So some of those things that, um, that Cam talked about in terms of that educational setting, the, the co-constructing of learning with the students and the community, it's important. If, if, if it's not co-constructed, it's not going to work. So an example of that, I guess this is where the Melbourne University, uh, Melbourne uh, grammar stuff comes in. So one of the things we've, we've done is used a, a, a social enterprise type model of tourism as a, as a, as a learning tool because you know, tourism is a, a, a viable opportunity for young people or for the, for the communities here. But the classroom lends itself to learning. This is a great learning environment. So we've built a trail out the back here, which taught, and there's a whole lot of bush medicine and bush tucker and all sorts of wonderful things out there that the young people absolutely know about. And so we worked um, with 110 young women from uh, um, Melbourne Grammar a couple of, about a month ago, where the young people um, taught those young people from Melbourne Grammar, 110 of them, um, in this space, about all the, where the bush tuckers found, where the, where the um, bush medicines found, and then we brought them up here and showed them how to use the bush tucker, how to make the bush medicine, and then they taught them some, some dancing, which was pretty ad hoc and came out of nowhere. But I guess the part of the co-design part of that is they were absolutely involved in, in the development of that program for those kids. And then one night, Cam and I were sitting over the campfire, around the campfire with them, and, um, and the girls, well, the girls, because they were all girls, because it was a girls' school, came up and said, Cam and Peter, change of plan. And Cam and I looked at each other and straight away thinking, oh, no, tomorrow's not going to go so well. But what they did is they'd been meeting together, talking about a strategy uh, to change, because it's a fairly rough walk through that way, and they'd done it about 20 times. <laughs> not quite 20, but quite a few times, and they decided on a different walk where they could find bush tucker and stuff, and they developed a whole new walk for the next group of girls uh, the, over the coming days and sat down with Cam and I and totally redesigned uh, the project, showed us initiative, showed us initi uh, um, innovation, and so it went on, and it was extremely successful. They're the sort of highlights, amazing things that happen when you allow young people to be educators, to be part of the co-design, to be part of the process of their own learning. I think, Peter, sorry, the, the really important part of that was not just that experience, because that's where you start, right? It's how we map that back to the mainstream educational curriculum. So that's in the literacy, the literacy, the numeracy elements of that, and everything in planning, in the, the measurement, um, the, you know, the reflections that we did together. It's the kids 
owned that, they had the experience, they weren't even particularly aware that that's what they were doing. When we mapped it back, that's where we made that um, uh, obvious to them. So in terms of leadership, you got the little thing. Um, action reflection and monitoring the process is critical. Building capacity of staff is critical. So we work with um, families who become part of the learning process, building their capacity, working with them to, uh, to understand the model and to how to work with us uh, and the young people themselves and be part of that co-design process. Reflecting uh, regularly with the young people. Developing a collective impact. You, you remember the, uh, the Medusa there. We're trying to bring those people together, recognising that each of us have something to offer and w if we work together uh, in a way that's constructive, there's a collective impact for these young people. It's, a, it's an absolute collective impact waiting to happen. The coaching and mentoring of staff, networking with those people in that Medusa uh, is all really, really, really important. So this is the model that we sort of, I guess, use, and it's really a simple one. Plan, act, reflect, learn, change. And it's not Cam and I doing this, it's actually the students doing this with us. And this is a continual process um, where we meet with the community regularly. We talk with the community about what's working and what's not working. And we actually find uh, that we're building an evidence base through the collection of voice. So we're having regular conversations, structured conversations with young people collecting their voice about their learning journey. We're collecting voice of the community. We're collecting voice of stakeholders to see what changes during the period of the program and again acting and reflecting on that process. So the next part I think the really important, well the next bit that's going to be challenging is how do we scale a model like this. There's some really important learnings and we've done a lot of research uh, internationally and looked at a whole range of uh, scaled flexible learning programs across the world in Brazil, <laughs> South Africa uh, and lo lots of developing uh, countries. There's some key things that come out Consultation design is critical. And that consultation and design needs to be contextual. It needs to be contextualised to the community that you're working with. We can't take something from here and put it over here. It won't work. There might be some principles that sit over the top, but the consultation and design needs to be done and contextualised with the community. Finance. William talked about finance. We'll all talk about finance because it's a really critical part. One of the things that often happen is we get, you know, these programs, uh, these innovative programs often get financed in a small cycle, a yearly cycle or, or a sometimes even shorter cycle than that. We need to look at some long-term cycling of funding or a cycle of funding that's long-term. It needs to be flexible because when you contextualise a project and a place, it's going to be slightly different and finance slightly different in, in each of those places. So it needs to take into account that contextualisation the delivery model needs to recognise, again, that contextual space. Um, there can be an overarching pedagogy, but that pedagogy needs to be contextualised into the place that it is. And we need to create an, ena an enabling environment. Um, government's got a big role here. Policy needs to ensure that projects like this are enabled and not disabled. We need to look at um, the things that aren't working, the systems that aren't working. I think. There are, we found anyway in our project that there are systems that are almost systemic racism. It almost blocks people um, rather than empowering people. And I think it's really important in that enabling environment to recognise those things and to change those models to work for the communities that we're working for. A classic example that we look at, and it really come, came up in our program really clearly, in terms of a system that's failed us, is one in where you record attendance. I mean, there's two things about that. One, we don't think that attendance automatically equates to engagement. And that's a really important thing to note. Just because a person's going to, or a young person's going to school doesn't mean they're engaged. We can see that just by walking through a classroom. But also, our attendance, we don't start at 8 o'clock in the morning when most kids go to school, because our um, is a, is a co-design with the students and they made a decision that they want to start later and finish later. But of course, when we try and input that into the system, it doesn't work. 
because the system says they've got to start at 8 o'clock and they've got to finish at 3. So if you looked at our students' attendance rates, they're actually not all that good in the system, but we know that actually um, there's a core group of our young people and some of them haven't been to school at all at age 15, are attending up to 90%. But of course the system doesn't record that because it fails the program, the flexible learning program. Where to next? I guess that's uh, really important. We try to get through a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, so what we're going to do is um, at 3 o'clock on Saturday in the uh, Knowledge Centre over there, we're going to run a workshop that looks a bit more in a bit more depth at this program. And each and every one of you can par play a part in that, I'm sure, as part of a collective impact. We think that, you know, there might be corporates here that might have an interest in in doing some work with us. There might be universities that are interested in doing work with us. There's certainly other government departments that should be looking at working with us. Um, and what we would like to do is to call you all together and to start to unpack this and look at ways in which we can start to develop a collective impact and a scaled model that we can uh, roll out across East Arnhem Land and maybe further. I mean, I think De Denise Bowden would say it's probably a model that could be rolled out across the nation. Thank you very much for listening. One of the things that we're really cognizant of, of course, is pathways and, uh, and pathways into, back into school is really important, but also pathways into vocational education. One of the really exciting projects that is uh, run by Gumach is uh, the Gumach Training Centre across here, and I'm going to ask Alan Rungan to come up and just have a little bit of a spiel about that wonderful project, um, and it's certainly one of the pathways that we've identified and are working with Gumach uh, to ensure that our students have that vocational pathway. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is also my privilege to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Yongu peoples, uh, on whose land we meet today. At Gama last year, Gumach Corporation Limited announced its intent to open the Gokula Regional Training Center at this very site. So 14th of December, 2017, marked a red letter day for the corporation when the first intake of students came through those red boom gates and started this, this program. I thought today I'll just touch on a brief background of the training center, what underpins the delivery and some of our achievements. The Gokula Regional Training Center concept was developed by the corporation and was originally inspired by an, by an aspiration to get Yondu people into mining jobs. The center was seen as a tightly integrated with Gulkula Mining Company's operation on this very plateau. But as the concept has evolved, it has retained the mining component, however, has been expanded to incorporate roles across a range of disciplines within and outside of mining, all with the focus of drawing high levels of employment of your new people. Gumach Corporation, have been the primary driving force behind the establishment of the training center. Other partners have engaged with the development of the training, most notably Rio Tinto, with the startup funding, and the, tertiary, and the territory and the federal governments as well, with grants to support the establishment and initial running of the facility. In addition to the existing facilities, we have built and constructed an accommodation facility, which is not far from here, towards my right. One would wonder why we chose this site. And the primary reason for that is to increase the likelihood of success. This site offers a buffer between the participants and the distractions that exist and okay in our communities. And it also offers options for participants to obtain hands-on training which is an important tenant of the program that, I, that is delivered at the moment. The overall vision of the board for the center is transforming lives through the creation of effective pathways 
into long-term employment. Specifically, the Gokula Regional Training Center will be a leading provider of work readiness programs where graduates will lead to them being highly sought after by employers and develop a high degree of confidence within them that successful completion of the program will lead to long-term employment outcomes. The mission is to muster community, government, and regional employers' support to increase the number of Yonlu people in the paid workforce through an effective work readiness program linked to jobs. The training center model comprises three key phases. Recruitment and preparation, the program itself, which is run in conjunction with an RTO in this case, in this case, Charles Darwin University, and a post-program support. Through an intensive recruitment, readiness activities are conducted to prepare potential participants and their families ahead of selection. The GRT's program is a live-in work readiness program of a 17-week duration with regular time back in communities throughout this period. So we work on a 10-day on and a four-day off roster. Returning home on a regular basis provides trainees with the opportunity to identify and learn to manage how the, to balance the demands of work and home. The program includes three key components. An induction of one week, participation in the chosen courses, and a job placement where the participant experience work over the last four weeks of the program. The post-program support is very important as well. When employed, graduates will take up a traineeship where literacy and numeracy training will continue throughout this period. Bridging processes are identified to assist those candidates with the capability and aspiration to pursue trade and professional pathways. The operating model of this for the center has been built around some thought out critical success factors. Mainly, and the first one is community ownership and involvement. Founded by community priorities. Strong and visible support from a broad cross-section of elders. An inclusion and participation of all clan groups in this region. Incorporating of in incorporation of indigenous identities, cultures, knowledge, and values. The quality and design delivery. It's demand-driven. It's founded on latest research and experience of successful outcomes. Literacy and numeracy skills, literacy and numeracy, life skills, work skills, and mentoring support for trainees. Engaging trainers and mentors who are invested in the achievement of great outcomes. The support for trainees continually identifying and overcoming barriers to long-term success. A program design that attends to the personal growth and long-term resilience for the participants. A case management approach that acknowledge, acknowledges the individual needs of participants. A demand for graduates. Successful outcomes will drive ongoing success. A quality program and rigorous selection Capable and successful graduates will lead to strong demand for graduates. And there, of course, there's strong partnerships. Quality partners that are motivated to be part of this transformational program. Delivery partners, funding partners, and local employers. And then, I guess the most important thing is the outstanding governance. Dedicated, dedicated resourcing and leadership, which is led by the board of the Gumach Corporation focus on outstanding program delivery, and continual pursuit for improved outcomes. Strong strategic and operational planning and execution, looking at risk management, management financial stability, and success. So what have we achieved so far? Since last year, we have completed two 17-week programs, and over the two periods offered courses 
in surface extraction, which is closely related to our mining operations, building construction, civil works, business administration, hospitality, conservation and land management, as well as health support services. And there's a strong alignment with um, literacy and numeracy skills right throughout, which is offered for about 18 hours per 10-day block. The students have also completed first aid training, driver safe training, some of them even full licenses achieved, a Money Matters program, and attended WorkSafe courses conducted by NT WorkSafe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all aware and we've seen some stats of the challenges that exist of attendance and retention in our organizations. It was no different in this program. Over the two intakes, so far our retention rate is close to 70%. We had much higher expectations, but 70% we're very, very pleased with. And an overall attendance rate of 85%. Five students achieving 100% attendance. That's 83 days of being on site. A key or the major difference between the GRTC program and the host of other training that occurs in the region is that every participant who completes the program successfully is guaranteed a full-time position in the workforce. Um, I'm just, just bear with me for one second. I thought we had one of our graduates here today. Is Dima here? No, probably, probably still at work. <laughs> so ladies and let me just end by saying the Gumat board is very proud to say that all 20 students who have completed the course were placed in full-time positions with employers from small business to government departments. Thank you very much.